Hello and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the Executive Editor with My Security Media and welcome to our Tuesday afternoon episode. And today we're going to do quarter two of 2021, a space sector update with Dr. Chris Flaherty. And he is with the My, My Space sorry, Warfare Analysis Lab. Uh, and uh, we had the last one at the end of March for quarter one. Uh, so we're going to be looking at what space activity has been occurring and there is a lot going on uh, across uh, the particularly in the UK we're going to be looking at today here in Australia and also in the US uh, we might touch on some other nations as well and as we sort of undergo a space race let's get a market space sector update uh, from Dr Chris Flaherty uh, Chris thanks for joining us again mate Thanks, Chris. And I very much like the celestial music that we introduced this segment with. Oh, celestial. OK, I'll take that. Um, now, you've done a uh, quite an extensive piece of work on this particular update. We've got some slides to share, but yeah. I think uh, maybe a catch up sort of the highlights for the last quarter for you that might be sticking out. Uh, and then uh, you let us know in terms of how you want to run through uh, the document. And we'll make this available for the audience as well. Uh, and we'll put this on our space and defense channel. Yep, I think um, when we last finished off, um, SpaceX was still yet to launch. It had finally a successful launch of the SN or the, or the prototypes starships, and it pr perfected its landing technique. And they're now pushing along towards a super heavy launch or a combined super heavy launch with their with their booster as well as their starship. Um, there's still some issues of controversy associated with that, particularly about the safety and sound profile. Um, but um, we'll wait and see how that will develop. Um, the other major, the other major, major space event, of course, is the Chinese have successfully manned their um, their space station, which is now growing in size. Um, it's a great piece of engineering. It really is. Um, it's just really interesting to watch that grow. There's been a bit of con there's been controversy, of course, with the way in which there, which there's been return of return of um, boosters and so forth. Um, these are issues which are pressing across the world about what we do about the develop about the, in the increasing uh, burden of space debris um, orbiting our planet. Um, this is a major environmental issue, um, and this needs to be thought about in these sorts of terms. Interestingly enough, we'll be looking at a couple of com com companies from the UK, or well, one in particular, our Sea Launch, which is very much focused on net on net zero on net on net impact, if you like. Um, the other major, of course, was that um, Integrity flew several times and continues to fly well beyond expectations. Um, and that's given a line to an entirely new new concept in terms of aeronautic engineering. Um, given the fact they're also now thinking of other places where, which de or other, other, other you know, bodies within our solar system, um, which can support, which have heavier atmospheres in which we can start using aeronautical, aeronautical um, probes. So, one of the interesting things is from now on, when you ask an aeronautical engineer to design me a craft, they'll say, well, which planet do you want it on? <laughs> Fair uh, enough. Because we now have ballooning on Venus. We have uh, flying on, you know, helicopters on Mars. And we're about to have, a, I think, a helicopter on one of the um, the Jovian satellite moons. So this there is, is a really interesting time. It really, yeah, well, look, and this is why uh, we're going to do this every quarter, because there is so much going on. Right. Uh, we have had the likes of Southern Launch, uh, Rocket Lab, uh, the uh, the space center out of uh, Adelaide also uh, on our channels over the over the months, uh, and we will continue to do so. And SpaceX should be uh, launching within the next sort of 24 hours. Uh, literally today, 29th of June, uh, they're putting with some 88 uh, on board satellites that they're about to launch. So really, day by day, a lot is happening. And you mentioned China uh, and a lot of the other nations. So there's a bit of a space race on now. Maybe let's walk through uh, your sort of highlights and what areas you want to cover. Uh, likewise, from the audience, if there's any particular areas you want to have covered, uh, we'll get Chris's comment on. Uh, you mentioned uh, the way that uh, China sort of launched their uh, ISS and some of the debris, um, but also we've also got plans for a new ISS uh, up there as well to replace the existing one. Uh, where where was that maybe at at the moment? Where do you see that uh, right. developing? Yep. The um, the situation with the ISS is it is actually hitting its its end of, end of life process. Um, now whether that takes five years or more, depending on how they actually manage that. What we're also seeing is that there's two other proposals out. They're not actually proposals. They will in fact I, they will happen. 
uh, Axiom Space Station will be constructed. It's going to be constructed off the ISS using that as its basic back, uh, backbone, and then it'll be released. Sierra Nevada Corporation is also preparing to build its own space station uh, to be serviced by the Dream Chase, which we'll talk about in the context of the US UK space ports. So and essentially, we're looking at several, potentially several space stations operating in Earth orbit. Um, the other great, the other of course potential is a space station which will be the gate, lunar gateway, um, respectively a space station for the moon. And if you look, if you look at a lot of the literature and a lot of the sort of commentary at the moment about Mar how the colon how the next mission to Mars, well, human mission to Mars will take place, increasingly the methodology is thinking in terms of there has to be either a space, either a, some sort of station installation on one of Mars's moons, or alternatively a station in orbit. Because again, it goes back to the ability. It's not a question anymore of fly me to the moon. It's the ability to to build a sustainable infrastructure around a planet or a planetary body or the moon, if it's a planetary bo a body like the moon, in order to sustain the sort of operations we have on ground. This is tied up as well as no longer are we sort of thinking in terms of we will go to, to go to a place and then come back and that becomes a celebration in its own right. It's about going there to actually permanently to permanently launch operations from the surface of the moon or on Mars or on any of the moons of, of Jupiter and Saturn. Um, the real issue at the moment is there is a fundamental shift occurring. I mean, this is a really interesting time because we're in the middle of a global pandemic. And I, I think we should talk about this just briefly. All the dates to do with the, the major innovations and change in space in terms of even, even the defence sector setting up space forces, all dated around 2020. And it's really interesting that the world has been completely embroiled in this pandemic. There are these fundamental technology shifts occurring um, in terms of a major flip occurring between space technology exploration, which was largely in the preserve of government and defence, flipping dramatically and massively over into private corporations. Um, the other thing, of course, being is that we are in our 60th or 70th year of space exploration and space technology. Um, you know, I, I was, I believe I watched the first landing on the moon of man, man walking on the moon. I think I did. I'm not really sure because I remember being, as a very young child, being shunted into a classroom, told to look at a black and white TV and was never explained why. But I do remember a lot of the, the paraphernalia or such as, you know, the, the little medallions um, of the... Um, Apollo 11 and so forth. So I probably did watch it. I'm not sure. But it's certainly, but I think you're making the point, it's in your lifetime. In my lifetime, um, we watched this happen, yeah. Yeah, and I think the, the other thing I'm getting out of here, and we might start with uh, your next slide, is the amount of interest now in uh, the launch locations from Earth uh, and getting that, because that sounds like that's going to be quite a competitive uh, area, or maybe not so much competitive, but certainly it it will make space... Uh, exploration and the use of space in our general travel uh, also. And that's something we've heard from Rocket Lab uh, as well. They want space planes where you uh, will catch a space plane as common as what you would have uh, a normal plane pre, pre pandemic, maybe. Perhaps that might have in fact happened. I think it, let's look at this roughly historic, this broadly historically. Um, if we take 1980s as a typical date or point in time. The, the notion of launching a satellite, these were large, heavy satellites that went largely into geo, geostationary orbit. They're mainly to do with telecommunications, TV and other applications like that. Um, these are stations, well, these are satellites being launched largely from the equatorial region. This is where we see the big dominant Cape Canaverals and other you know, major space, space launch facilities. The, the situation that's actually happening now in our, gener in our decade or in our year 2020, 2021, is a fundamental shift towards the idea of small rockets, small payloads, with a with a with about with a series of classes of satellites that begin with a small micro satellite in around the 400 to 500 kilogram range, descending in order down to micro satellites and then nano satellites, and now everyone no doubt has been hearing about the CubeSat, which is the 10 by 10 by 10 cube. Uh, Microdization micro, micro of technology, our capacity to build these things and the capability we can cram into these, these increasingly smaller objects um, is dramatic, dramatically changing the notion of, of, of launch. In a sense, we're looking at small, we're not looking, even though the market at the moment has been dominated by the Titanic space, you know, Starship, which is 100 tonnes effectively launch capacity. 
Uh, we're no longer talking about pounds per launch. We're talking about tons per launch. At the other end of the market or the other end of the market is this growing issue about small launch. Those small launches into low Earth orbit and suborbital can occur pretty well anywhere on the planet is because you're looking for a particular orbit you want to go into. And this is actually meaning that what this talk, today's talk is largely going to be something about rockets. It's about spaceports and spaceports being merged or growing out of airports. And so today's talk is really looking at what's actually developing in the UK, which is really exciting. Um, in terms of the UK has, has effectively it's called the Launch UK program. And it's looking at the UK having identified already several sites across the country, which are potentially going to see either vertical launch or horizontal launch. Now, horizontal launch is probably the most is the most interesting. I mean, I think anyone anyone with a who's interested in space technology, space exploration, will know about Pegasus. It's a you know a module. It's a commercial. It's a commercial size plane which launches a rocket from its underbelly. Uh, no doubt, people have seen Virgin Orbit and Virgin Galactic. Virgin Orbit is horizontal launch, as is Virgin Galactic, the different, the, both of which involve air launch capability. And later on in this talk, we'll talk about sea launch as well, because there's been several examples, and there's a brand new company coming out of the UK called Black, Black Arrow Space Techno, uh, Black Arrow. So, as I said, the, the market itself, and now we go to the map of the UK, the UK is really best understood as a series of what you call the Northern Cluster, and then you're talking about the, the, the uh, southwestern coastline of the United Kingdom, starting in Scotland and moving it, progressively moving down. Now, the UK, the interesting thing about this is that even though we're looking potentially at seven sites, it's not the case that anyone thinks that all seven sites may ultimately be operational. Some may prevail, some may not. What is happening in the UK? The UK actually has one massive advantage. Um, it's a it's, it's, it's total outcome of the, of the Cold War period of, no, of, the, years, of the NATO years. Um, they've got large military airports, former military airports. They have very long runways and strong runways. Um, they've got airports that actually that point out to sea. They've got airports that actually are in non-populated areas. Um, essentially, the whole if you like, the whole structure underneath this is that um, launch, it's not the launch, launching a rocket really is under, is talking about an infrastructure in terms of how, it's not so much the, the launching of the rocket itself, it's actually how a country is preparing itself to be a licensing authority in terms of getting a rocket into space under international treaty. And the issue paramount is not only economic viability of having a space port itself as an outgrowth of an airport, does it actually have a, does it have an opera, a launch operator that can actually fit with that particular airport configuration? And secondly is actually how is that country structuring its underlying legislative and regulatory system in terms of what it will allow to be launched from that country and how will that be undertaken? And the current preference at the moment, if you look at the northernmost cluster, these are all dedicated largely to vertical launch. What they're trying to get advantage of there is the polar orbit in terms from the UK. If you look at the pink bubbles, all those are largely dedicated towards horizontal launch. And um, Chris, if you want to come in at any point and just ask questions. Or no, no, well, I'm, I was going to, my first observation is they're all in, mainly in Scotland. So... Uh, what would be the impact if Scotland uh, separates from the UK if they want to do? Well, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's a political decision. I mean, look, I mean, look, if it ever ended up being a sort of a Kazakhstan type situation, I'm sure they'll just lease it back to the United Kingdom. Well, the other, uh, the other question I had here is most of these uh, airports and the like, how much of these are in private hands versus uh, government? Well, in actual fact, they're actually, they're actually based under pub public private partnerships. Right. So, for example, um, there's an excellent interview on the Angry Astronaut with um, uh, Nuki um, Airport, one of the executives of Nuki Airport, and the way in which it's described is that, that yes, there's the there's the government entity which largely sort of manages, if you like, the airport. The airport itself is a private concern, and then there's the private own, there's private enterprise. So, public private these are all public private management, and essentially, I mean, this is the other thing is we go from this transition from predominantly government owned to government directed to government support to commercial enterprise. And, and I think, yeah, please, yeah. 
Well, how many of these are being used or are these just proposed? New Key is, these are proposed sites. New Key is actually the first site which is on the verge of getting its operating license. And it's expected towards, I think the latest interview I saw, they're thinking in June next year, they'll actually start um, commercial operations for Virgin Orbit. Now, how does this link to the UK Australian bridge, the space bridge as well? Does this provide opportunities for Australia or yeah, where, where does that fit in in terms of if this starts to, to occur? Is this not going to be competing? Well, and interestingly enough, let's take uh, an operation like Virgin Launch. We'll, we'll compare two, 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 two examples of mobile launch because on one level you're talking about fixed launch, vertical launch, or you're talking about mobile. At the moment, most of the, most of the times when you look at most of, really, most of the current legislation, it, the examples are given are air launched, but you also have sea launch capability as well. And sea launch is actually effectively launching off a converted oil rig. As we, there are two famous examples with SpaceX of two of these, but there's an older company called Sea Launch itself, which was a which was a conglomerate, mostly Russian, mostly Russian, um, and has now ended up mostly in Russian hands. Um, interestingly enough, in China, they're actually looking at a very similar sort of proposal from a Chinese perspective. In actual fact, the Chinese have actually successfully launched rockets from barges in the Yellow Sea. Um, in, the, in the British case, the, 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 the issue with launching is that having mobility in your capacity to launch gives you, if you like, global strategic economic opportunities. And the other issue is you can take the launch to your customer, which is the most effective thing. So in a case of the, the, the economic model, which Nuki would be thinking about, would be its, 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 its viability in terms of the European market, in terms of being close to European um, entities that want to need space launch capability. Um, in terms of Virgin Orbit itself, it's actually looking at several sites around the world, as is, we'll talk about the US, Nuki is also involved in a, in a, um, a commercial, preliminary commercial rela relationship with um, Southern, with Sierra Nevada Corporation, the Dream, Train, Dream, Dream Chaser, which we'll cover off shortly. But also in the case of a, a ship like, um, or a concern like um, Black Arrow, uh, that's the Dream Chaser there. Uh, the Dream Chasers, are, we'll actually just take a little aside just to talk about the Dream Chasers. It's a fascinating, <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, it's a fascinating piece of technology. It's, it's, it's basically, as you see by the scale of the individual standing there, it's the smallest version of the it space. It is small, space. hey, that is uh, pretty cool. It um, has a certain amount of tonnage in terms of what it can actually convey. It's been designed primarily to service the space station, both the International Space Station, also the Sierra Nevada Corporation Space Station as well, uh, which will effectively be a space station space factory. Um, its 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 capability is to largely launch from the continental United States, service land, um, dock at the space station, whichever one we're talking about, and then return. New Key is actually being signed up as is Glasgow as is Glasgow uh, Glasgow. I think I'll get that right. Right, I'm terribly sorry if I mispronounce some of these. No, no, no that's okay. Check it because there's a lot of detail in here. Glasgow, Glasgow Preswick Airport. Um, both of them are actually looking at opportunities for the green, Dream Chaser, uh, particularly um, Nuki, um, because the, Nuki, the, the, the Dream Chaser can effectively land anywhere. The, the, the defining limitation, if you like, is the Dream Chaser requires 8,000 feet of runway in order to land. So just think of this, if you can all remember back seeing the space shuttle come down, it, it largely comes down as a glider it you know has its has its drag parachute it hits the runway and it sl gradually slows down so in the case of the dream chaser it takes about eight thousand most of the major british runways we're talking about in terms of their perspective spaceports all have runways in, in around the nine thousand foot mark again they're 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 a, they're a, they're a, a carryover from the cold war period when these were fairly large nato airports um or you know, military 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 bases now Conceptually, what we're talking about is that it's it's not so much, again, we're moving away from this idea of launch as an event in its own right, the launch is actually plugging into something else. So what's it actually plugging into? Well, it's plugging into the idea of a space-based economy. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is what does that actually mean? What is a space-based economy? Um, up to now, we talk about space tourism. That's a, that's, an, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big aspect of that because, in actual fact, one of the other major players in this is both is both Blue Origin with its space tourism module, which is the, um, the new Shepard. And of course, we've got um, uh, Richard Branson and uh, Virgin, uh, yep. Galactic, Virgin Galactic, which is actually an air launch. Um, the difference being Blue Origin is vertical takeoff. It has to take off from a launch pad. 
uh, Virgin Galactic is a um, it's an air, it's an aircraft mothership which carries the actual rocket ship. So again, it's an air launch concept. So um, either of those can operate easily from any commercial airport. And it goes back to where's your market. So one of the interesting points is that even though the you're asking how could these plug into an Australian context, the question is is do you have an airport like an international airport which can safely land a seven four seven? Because that's what Cosmic Girl is. She's a converted seven four seven. Well, the they've just spent a lot of money uh, increasing the defence uh, runways as well for the the joint strike fighter. So I wonder if that's uh, assisted at all because there's a number of runways that they've been working on and developing well, I mean, uh, just for that program. Well, it raises a really interesting question because, for example, for for a craft like the, um, the Dream Chase to operate, it not only you know effectively it's, it's operating and circumnavigating the planet. So if you think about, for example, um, one of the interesting early features of um, just looking at it right now, sorry about this, um, Campbell, Campbelltown Airport, which is in Scotland as well, its military runway was actually seen as the alternate or the emergency runway for emergency landing in the space shuttle. So, for example, anywhere on the planet which actually has got suitable runways, these are going to be regarded as, you know, potentially if a dream chaser has has an issue, it needs emergency landing capabilities, it needs emergency landing opportunities. So you could potentially see, for example, a country like Australia fitting into that model. I mean, one of the interesting things about Australia, I think we'll cover off this, Australia actually is a unique is a unique position in relation to the world because of its continental position, but also Australia actually is fundamentally linked up in terms of it's part of that entire network of, 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 of ground stations that are essential for, you know, for, for any mission off world. Yep. Uh, hence we go to the famous parks, you know. Well, we've, uh, CSIRO have just signed up another agreement for, I think, a Mars mission too that um, uh, and also the, involved also, with that. And also intuitive machines with the next group of commercial lunar missions. Correct, yes, that's yeah. with their so, robotics. Yep. Yeah. So, and essentially, again, we get back to the, and essentially, the, I suppose if you're asking a more broader question, if you were to build a spaceport, what would you be thinking about? Let's take the UK as an example to start with. In their particular instance, they were they were mainly looking at airports that actually had very little residential build up because of the safety issues, as well as the disruptions of local to local you know to local populations. Uh, they're looking at airports that could have a have a safety range, preferably water, uh, or flying over you know flying basically taking off and flying over you know, over the coastline onto onto clear clear water. Um, you're potentially looking at a, it already is actually in a marriage relationship, if you like, with a commercial operator, which it operates from. And the other thing is that airport, that spaceport is part of a global alliance of spaceports. Because at this point in time, you have to start thinking in terms of not only is the spaceport a, a, a national capability, but has it fit into a, glo into a global system? Because, you know, you can actually, if you were to launch a rocket, for example, you take a concept like an Earth to Earth rocket transporter, um, it's an hour transportation in either direct across the planet. So, for example, you know we're in a planet which is constantly revolving. An object in space goes at seventeen thousand miles per hour. So, the International Space Station takes about nine or ten rotations. So, the time that we've actually been talking, um, which will be about an hour, <laughs> just spun around how much things have spun around this planet on an, on our planet, planet itself, which is rotating. So, and essentially, when you start thinking about your relationship with building a, space, a national spaceport, you have to be a country which has actually got that that space or that capability. And Australia certainly is one of those. It also has actually is is part of that that global ground station, um, you know, global uh, space station or space communication, space space monitoring, as well as the fact is that you're dealing with objects which are spinning around this planet. So essentially, the, the, the foreseeability of fact, oh, do we need to, you know, do we set ourselves up? Because at some point we'll have to take a, a dream chase, we'll have to come to land. But then, of course, you're also talking about advanced technologies. You know, what are we actually talking about when we're talking about a space economy? Well, we're talking about mining in space, potentially, on the asteroid belt. Uh, we're also talking about what is it we can produce in zero, you know, microgravity or zero gravity environment, um, 3D printed organs. Um, because water holds its holds. If you've ever seen a, an astronaut hold a, 
of a droplet of water, it's a perfect sphere. It holds its shape. Uh, we're talking about the production of solar units, which are much more advanced than we can produce on Earth. If we produce them on Earth, they're highly toxic to do so. In space, it's a safe environment. Uh, what else are we talking about? We're talking about the produce, production of certain types of fiber optics, which are much more efficient. These are high. So we want to think about this in terms of the drive commercially, which is where you're looking at your SpaceX's, is to try and commercially drive down the cost of a rocket launch to shift that from pounds to tonnage. But at the same time, what you're also asking yourself is that if we're producing, an if we're producing a commodity in space, what's the economics of doing that? Is it, is it, so, is it, is it so valuable that it far exceeds the, the costs of launching to get the materials into space, to make it in space and then return it from space? So if you look at the UK business model, interestingly enough, they're envisaging a situation where a dream chaser is taking off from Australia. Oh, correction. Sorry, I just got confused there. Off from the United States, servicing a space station, then returning with a product. That product's unloaded from the, from the dream chaser. That then goes to facilities for processing. Now, the next question, of course, being, which is interesting about when you look at the new key commercial model, it actually, it actually leads into C, F, ground rail transport so ultimately for distribution so essentially it perform it performs exactly the same function as any commercial airport in terms of the distribution of goods it's just coming in from um from from a production system which is circumnavigating the earth so that i think essentially you're asking the question then of course we look at it purely from an australian perspective in terms of you know if we were to have a virgin galactic or virgin orbit or a sea launch um, you know, you know, coming in, you know, operating on Australian waters or Australian skies. Therefore, that brings in the question about services and support. And I think this is the the major thing. Is I think the the one level we're focused on the, on the building and the construction of rockets, the building and construction of launch facilities. But what comes out of that is the other industries which begin to actually develop around that in terms of servicing that, as well as actually taking product from that and turning it into other commodities. And of course, then there's space tourism. Space tourism is anticipated to be one of the major growth areas. So it is foreseeable to say, could we see Virgin Galactic space tourism from Sydney Airport? Highly likely, not, imp it's not improbable. It's well, one of the other one of the other things I wanted to raise was New Zealand seems to have the same capabilities because it's an island, uh, yeah. has suitable launch locations as we've covered before with say Rocket Lab. Yeah, that's correct. In actual fact, you need to understand the Australian. When you're talking about the Australian, it's really the Australian, New Zealand, Pacific context, or you know, in terms of our particular, our particular regional area. Um, Australian space capabilities currently are highly dependent on New Zealand. I, mean, I think earlier this year we had the launch of an ANU CubeSat via well, via by a rocket lab from New Zealand. So essentially, um, un until Australia begins to actually develop its own space launch capabilities, well. And there's about three companies we'll be looking at, which is Equatorial Launch, Southern Launch, and also Gilmore Space. Well, that's actually Gilmore Space's tech. tech. Now, I think you've interviewed either most of those companies, haven't you, Chris? We've had, yeah, we've had Gilmore on as well, uh, yeah. and also Southern Launch. Yeah. I'm sorry about my camera then. I don't know what it just decided it wanted to have a break. So well done, Chris, for keep going. Um, maybe let's let's follow on on an update on Australia and what you have seen. It's a good segue now. We've mentioned Gilmore, yeah. Southern. Yeah. and a few others. Um, yeah, yeah what, what have been some of your observations? Gilmore has been doing a few interesting things. Well, yeah, in actual fact, I mean, uh, Gilmore, again, what we're looking at in the Australian situation is actually running very very much parallel to the United Kingdom, as far as I can see and tell. Um, what we're looking at there is Gilmore was, that's actually one of its, its test, contest proof of concept, um, which they've developed a, um, a mobile a flatbed um, launching rig. Um, the actual craft itself, I think they're calling it the Innis. So I'm going to mispronounce this. I'm really sorry. The no. DART was the actual, the DART actually was the Australian um, defence. Um, it was a commercial rocket, but it was only, it's quite small. It was actually one of the first commercial launches we saw from Australia in 2020, which was carrying an, a RAF, a Royal Australian Air Force package. Um, Gilmore Space, it's called the ERIS, -E Ernest? Eris. Eris, Eris. I'm terribly sorry about that, folks. That's okay. The Eris oh, Orbital Rocket, yeah, 25 
high, three-stage rocket capable of launching small satellites. Yeah, that's it, and it's 25 meters high. Um, again, what it looks at, again, what we're looking at is this notion, uh, this idea of building a space industry around the small launch, micro launch, nano nano launch, or nano satellite capability. Um, uh, and essentially, the other thing we've got to think about is: Are we also just are we talking about satellites? Because most of the the commentary that you see says it's launching satellites. I mean, essentially, one of the major business cases being made in the UK is they're looking at. 10% of the global market in terms of small satellite launch. Uh, for the UK, that would roughly equate to something in the order of about three, three and a half thousand satellites being launched by 2035. Um, comparatively, SpaceX is launched over, is in the process of launching a, a mega cluster of 12,000 satellites. So one of the, but the other interesting thing is if you look at that, that statistic about the UK in terms of them cornering a section of the satellite market, only about, uh, it comes to a, something like the estimates about 146 tonnes for argument's sake. About six tonnes of that is actually, is actually military. The rest is commercial and civil. So you're seeing a huge shift towards commercial civil market rather than actually defend, again, defence and governmental dominated. But the other thing is, is we're not just talking about launch, small payload launches of satellites into Earth orbit. We're also talking about space probes. For example, one of the major industries I think which is going to start developing is is people are going to get seriously interested about finding what is actually on in the asteroid belt. I mean it's not I mean for example one of the one of the projected ideas is with Virgin Orbit is their capacity to stick and stick a the third stage, a second stage onto the rocket which is already deployed, which is already coming off um, Cosmic Girl, then itself boosting into 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 a mission towards the Mars, taking a probe. Um, or, a mission, or a mission towards Venus taking a probe. So essentially, we're starting to look at people in both in academic as well as commercial interests, such as, for example, sending a probe into the asteroid belt to find out what exactly is there in terms of what's economically exploitable, ultimately. Yeah, in terms, in terms of mining, of, right? Minerals. We're talking about mining opportunities, particularly water ice in terms of the production of fuel. We're also looking at just um, in terms of underst a better understanding. I mean, I think um, one thing is that, think of it this way, a lot of people ask, well, you know, in terms of science, science has always traditionally been government or university led. What happens if you actually say, well, science is also commercially led, but what is it that they're commercializing? They're commercializing the knowledge. Um, so it essentially it becomes actually of trade in information, knowledge, concepts, and ideas. So for example, if you've got commercial, you know, commercial missions being probes being sent to the asteroid belt, they're collecting data or information everyone is going to be interested in about what they And they will buy that data. Well, yeah, and essentially, you know, I know that sounds unpalatable because we always talk about free, free opportunity, you know, free opportunity, you know, free opportunity, also free access to information and data. But we also have to accept that there is actually, there is such you know, this idea that information becomes a tradable commodity in its own right. Yeah. And essentially, you know, that doesn't, and, and it's not a big concept to wrap your head around because we actually are dealing, we are now primarily an information knowledge based culture and small society. Um, I mean, you know, if you want to take a rule aside, a rule left view since the um, recent UAP, not uh, correction, uh, UFO reports come out of the Pentagon, um, you know, one of Carl Sagan's original propositions, this is the reason why the golden record was sent on Voyager, was that he anticipated extraterrestrial civilizations, if they existed, would be actually trading, would be primarily trading information about each other. That would be the major galactic commodity. Well, we have so market. Was, <laughs> it's a bit like this, Chris, in terms of market updates and market yeah. research. Uh, yeah, exactly. You're doing all the hard work. <laughs> so, you know, the golden record was sent out there primarily with information about us. In actual fact, Carl Sagan's original thinking was that, was that why we're doing it is because he and he, he envisaged in his imagination that a, a space faring civilization would be so old, but they'd be interested primarily. They don't have a lot of contact with each other because of the, the difficulties of traveling. From one, you know, from one galaxy to the next, or solar system to the next. So they actually trade, but they are able to trade information with each other. Well, look, just the commoditization is all right. So all we have to do is now wait for the golden alien golden record record to come back to us. Well, That's not from what I saw in that UFO report. There's not much there. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe let's touch, finish off on New Zealand in terms of your notes. University of New South Wales, Canberra Space M2 CubeSat satellite. Yeah, we, we, um, uh, we covered up. that. Um, that's more or less a bit of, we covered that actually last time because it had launched. But again, it goes back to, I think it reinforces the idea that the, the at the moment, 
the growing market in Australia. And it's useful to look at the UK by analogy because it's almost it's it's a more developed it's a more it's a more mature market. But it does actually show that because Australia is so you know, Australia is so similar to the United Kingdom in terms of its history and so forth and its technology and so forth and its economics. Um, we're almost looking at very much parallel development in Australia when you compare that to the United Kingdom um, in terms of being a country which is primarily looking at micro small satellite launch, primarily developing rocketry in the small payload category, uh, primarily building spaceport spaceport airports which have the capacity to take on you know air, air horizontal launch capability we are looking at australia i think at abbott's point in queensland the post the start of for, for of building a, a vertical launch facility as we are looking in south australia and the area peninsula as well as the traditional Woomera range or ranges you know it's clustered around the traditional Woomera area so essentially it's it, you're thinking in terms of and then you're looking at that, that capability for transfer in terms of technology transfer between the two countries in terms of opening trade opportunities and trade relationships. Um, and the final thing, of course, being is traditionally the British were actually quite dependent on Australia in terms of their ability to launch a satellite or launch an ob or launch because they were heavily dependent on the 60s and 70s. In fact, Black Arrow Technologies is born out of that historical tradition of Britain developing its rocketry here in Australia for launch. Uh, interestingly enough, when Newquay becomes operational next year, we're the first time a commercial satellite has actually been launched from the United Kingdom, and over there will be a horizontal launch using Virgin Orbital. So essentially, what we're looking at is a lot of, I think, potentially in the in the long term, it could be two op economic opportunities for two countries. And second point being is that not only is Newquay well su su situated in terms of it, it's near. Um, one of Britain's major deep space communication centres. That parallels in terms of their, their side of the planet or their, their hemisphere. What we have in Australia, of course, is our, our deep space communication centres as well, capability. And in reality, are if you even look at the American mission, which is the commercial mission, which is intuitive machines going to the moon, part of the commercial setup was they had to have the capacity to bring in continuous global communications, global which means that you bring in Australian facilities as well as other facilities across the planet. Because again, we have to think in terms of, you know, we're a spinning, a spinning ball. Yeah. Well, we off. already have, uh, we did interview, it. yeah, sorry to interrupt. We did interview yeah. Defend, uh, Defend Techs, uh, hmm. which is researchers out of RMIT, uh, University of Sydney and the uh, University out of uh, Bundeswehr in, in Germany. So we do have Australian and European uh, collaboration underway already, yeah. and we have covered that. And we mentioned uh, rockets and propulsion. Uh, the next one uh, I wanted to cover before we finish off yeah. is uh, this particular one on nuclear fission rocket engines. Uh, maybe talk us through this one. Yeah, essentially we're sort of like shifting up a bit of a gear because we've been talking about conventional rocketry and we've been talking about you know space ports and the economics underpinning that. Um, but the interesting thing is that Rolls-Royce in the United Kingdom is a major player in, in the nuclear industry. Yeah. Uh, and they've signed the, the major innovation contract to produce a nuclear propulsion engine. Um, what we put up there is, a, is just a very simplified model of how to give people an understand of how a nuclear propulsion rocket engine actually works. Um, why are we pursuing this technology? Well, it's been around for a very long time. It's not, it's not an entirely new concept. So the notes we talk about basically back in the 60s, the United States had already built these. Um, the, the major um, problem always had been is the, is the placing of a nuclear, potentially a nuclear reactor, of launching a nuclear reactor off the planet um, and placing a nuclear, a nuclear reactor in space. I mean, that, that was a, an early problem in terms of, of, of the whole global regime or set up in, set up in 67, and also the test ban treaty and so you know, the earlier test ban treaty in space. I forgot my dates right. Um, why are we pursuing this? Because at the moment to go to Mars takes, we're looking at fairly long trips. If we use a nuclear propulsion engine, we have a much shorter trip. It can be as low as potentially 90 days in some cases for a trip to Mars. Um, one of the interesting things is Elon Musk himself a couple of years ago actually posited that he could envisage the Starship actually fit it with a nuclear propulsion engine. Um, in in relate as well as its conventional sort of chemical engines in terms of its ultimate landing on the planet or wherever. So essentially, this is this is sounds 
a bit science fictiony, but this but is that's actually, the whole point, isn't it? <laughs> this is a fundamental. This is a technology which exists. We know, and it's a question of actually building one. There have been test versions of these built in the last several, you know, last few decades. But potentially, this actually fundamentally changes our ability for ex for solar system exploration and going to places which, at the moment, are looking prohibitive in terms of you know a, 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 a manned mission to Mars is problematic in terms of ultimately you know having pilot having astronauts coping with the transit to Mars and the return. So essentially, this is about dramatically shortening that that actual that that trip. And it's, this is this is essential in terms of ultimate exploration. Well, that I mean, we'll come to something which looks straight out of Thunderbirds. <laughs> and talk us through. This is the Skylon, uh, Skylon. configuration Skylon. by um, the Reaction Engines Limited, another UK company. Yep. Again, this is um, it looks straight out of um, science fiction. Uh, most industry analysts think this is this is a the engine itself is a proven concept. What's fascinating about this is it's this idea of see we're up to now. We've been, let's take the Dream Chaser. The Dream Chaser is essentially mounted on the top of a conventional rocket and launched into space. It goes into orbit, uh, has an engine to take it, you know, a booster, a small, you know, an engine to take it somewhere. It then comes back to orbit. It's like the space shuttle basically flies down like a conventional glider. What we're looking at here is this concept, which has been central, has been sitting, I mean, almost central to, you know, but not only science fiction as well as conventional science, is the idea of building a spacecraft or a plane spacecraft that can launch from a conventional airport, work like a, a jet plane, uh, ultimately make the transition to space, becoming a rocket, up and docking with a space station or, commit, or carrying out a mission in space. Then deorbiting and returning back and landing on it on back on this runway. So basically, it's a single, a single, what's rough logic called a single stage launch concept plane. So this is the, if you like, the next level on, the next generation on in terms of. The space it's a bit plane. like the space plane out of New well, Zealand we mentioned, yeah. Yeah. So essentially, there's these these concepts have been around for quite a while. They have dominated science fiction, um, or science fiction, you know. But the realities are is that this this particular engine configuration or particular engine design, most industry pundits, and I do encourage people to look at this and have a look at the technology and have a look at and try and understand it. Um, because it this this potentially um, could have fundamental implications in terms of the amount of tonnage we can rapidly get into space. See, one of the essential issues is is that we're moving towards a situation where up to now, when we thought about rocket uh, space exploration, it's you know you look at something like a Saturn V. It's an enormously large rocket um, in order to get actually quite a small amount of payload into space. It's just the the, the tyranny, if you like, of escaping Earth's, Earth's gravity. Um, now we're looking at Elon Musk is looking at fundamentally changing the entire economic equation of space in terms of space exploration, the space economy. Which is which is basically moving towards cheaply moving not pounds into space but tons into space, and we're talking about multi tons into space. Hence the creation of Starship. This is again is an op is a, is, a, is is again driving that same direction as building a craft, which has the capacity to pretty well launch from anywhere, take multi tons into space, operate like a spacecraft, and then return like then return like an aircraft, and having a unique clean engine which actually performs both. Um, I think in the notes we also talk about uh, uh, another type of Virgin. Virgin may, in fact, is pursuing another technology opportunity with another United States company, um, which is uh, solar electric propulsion. Um, and this also fits in with the idea of the nuclear tug. If you like, think of space rocketry or the way we should, way we're now starting to think about um, space, about the whole idea of how do humans get off the get off the surface of the planet and go into space, and then how do they operate in space? It's a bit like, you know, you know the old fashioned babushka, the Russian dolls? Each yes, one the, yep. a, a small little one. Think of each one of those babushka, each one that you un, un, as it as it opens up and reveals the next one. Each one's got a different type of rocket engine. So think of example that, for example, let's take for, theoretically, you know, just for argument's sake, as a, uh, a starship, it gets launched by a conventional chemical rocket booster, 
into orbit. It then attaches to a nuclear propulsion space tug, which then pushes it, you know, as fast as possible to Mars. It detaches from that. It then uses its, its chemical rockets, and it's really been refueled perhaps at a way station on the way on one of the, Mar one of the Martian moons, um, and then goes into deorbit and lands on, on Mars with its, you know, full, full, you know, chemical rockets. And essentially what you're looking at is this notion or with, or with Virgin Orbit, the concept is an aircraft is a type of reusable rocket or a reusable first stage. It launches the 30,000 feet, drops the rocket, rocket takes off chemical propulsion rocket, gets into the into Earth orbit. It then it then releases its second stage. That second stage is a, um, a solar electric engine. So you're dealing with different types of propulsion yep. to get from A to B. I like it. And it's, I think, as you point out, uh, on an ongoing basis, this technology is known and it's available. It's just a matter of uh, making it happen. It's implemented. We'll look, we'll look, what we'll do, we'll put the show notes on. Um, uh, we do also had uh, Cleos. We mentioned SpaceX is yeah. waiting to launch up to 88 spacecraft to orbit. It has been delayed for a few days, uh, so we'll find out. Uh, maybe about seven o'clock or thereabouts, uh, Eastern Standard Australian time. Uh, Cleos is there. We've also had Cleos on. We had uh, an interview with Andy Bauer, their CEO, and I've got some shares in Cleos. So hopefully, uh, they have a successful launch on the SpaceX uh, Transporter Two uh, and uh, that particular mission. So if you sort of want something to watch tonight. Uh, get onto YouTube and that uh, SpaceX launch will be telecast. So look, that's it from us. I think um, Chris will post this uh, session on yeah. to uh, spaceanddefence.io. Um, the last one, I think we covered off on the Skylon uh, and yeah, we've pretty much covered off uh, all of uh, your particular briefing notes today. Um, okay. And thank you very much. What, what's maybe some of the highlights to look out for other than tonight? or hopefully tonight's uh, launch. Anything well, else coming up in the next quarter? Well, I think the other thing that would probably dominate the next quarter, we were um, thinking, or well, there's been planning in MySpace security for a conferences and or some sort of more live event. Oh, good. I'm so glad you reminded me. I forgot. Well, we, we were going to go to the site. <laughs> so you've got, ten minutes, you've got nine minutes to sell us on the yeah, site. Come well, on, look, um, we are. We're going to put a, 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 a seminar and a, a one-day conference together here in Sydney. That's the idea. Uh, everything's been sort of th th uh, thrown into turmoil at the moment in terms of planning. We're in a couple of week lockdown, uh, but certainly uh, late September, early October. And so if you're interested in that particular domain, uh, even if you want to um, to give a presentation, if you're researching in this field, uh, please reach out. But uh, Chris is assisting us with the program uh, and uh, we'll be reaching out to the industry for a particular focus. One of those is the UK Australian bridge, but I think there's enough there, particularly from say New Zealand. And we've already had a range of uh, people in the industry on My Security TV. So we'll be speaking to them as well. We do have a space and defense playlist on MySec TV on our YouTube channel. Uh, so all of these interviews are there and built up over time. So also, yeah, th thank you, Chris, go. I, I just will add in, but even though what we I think what we're, what we're envisaging is we're actually more focused on the actual civil space market. Correct. Um, I mean, you know, the realities are is that because of this massive change taking in, in terms of civil capability, these all have defence implications, and that's not denied. Um, but really, the the focus is actually now talking about the true a true space economy thinking in terms of what's available and how this technology is ultimately going to start impacting our lives, and how we actually start making use of this technology to heaven forbid turn a buck, uh, to use yeah. some expression or American expression. But it, it's its fundamental focus is on the civil is on civil space, civil space market, civil space industry. Well, you mentioned the data, you mentioned the research. I think also the amount of satellites going up uh, in terms of the payloads that they have, you can then start to, to trade. I mentioned Cleos is a perfect example where they're basically launching uh, satellites and then selling uh, their RF uh, capability to that, to the market. And whether that be defense or law enforcement or others, uh, but effectively they're using space to commercialize data as a service. Uh, and so that's what they're doing. So look, noting on seven minutes, and thank you for reminding me on that, Chris. Uh, we'll continue on our spaceanddefence.io channel. Uh, and uh, in terms of that conference, we'll keep you updated. 
but uh, thank you so much to Dr. Chris Flaherty of My Space Analysis Warfare Lab. Uh, and appreciate it. And we'll have, we've also got a set of um, a script notes. We didn't strictly keep to these, um, but I encourage people to have a read of them because we, there was a lot of We will, we yeah, the read. link will be out. We'll have this up uh, probably within uh, the next sort of 24 hours and this will be yep. in the show notes uh, as it goes up onto MySec TV. So Chris, thank you so much once okay. again. We'll see you yep. back here uh, around September. I reckon the so. idea. Okay, yep. all, all right, the thanks, best, Chris. have a good day. Thank you thanks very much. Bye -bye.